framing. In this video, we are going to see about framing. To service the network layer, data link layer uses the service provided to it by the physical layer. Physical layer accepts a raw bit stream and delivers it to the destination. This bit stream may contain error that is, number of bits received may not be equal to the number of bits transmitted. The data link layer breaks the stream into discrete frames and computes a checksum for each frame. At the destination, the checksum is recomputed. The breaking of the bit stream by inserting spaces or time gaps is called framing. Since it is difficult and risky to count on timing and mark the start and end of each frame, various simple methods used for framing are Character count Starting and ending characters with character stuffing Starting and ending flags with bit stuffing Character count This framing method uses a field in the header of frame to specify the number of characters in the frame. A disadvantage with this framing is that the count can be garbled by transmission error. For example, if a character count of 5 in the first frame becomes 7, the destination will go out of synchronization and will be unable to locate the exact start of the next frame. Character Stuffing The Frame Format In Character Stuffing, the special character data link escape that is DLE is stuffed in front of control character when it appears as a part of data. Bit stuffing. The format is as follows. In bit stuffing, a specific bit is stuffed into the outgoing character stream. Each frame begins and ends with a special bit pattern 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0 called a flag byte. When 5 consecutive ones are encountered in the data, it automatically stuffs a 0 bit into the outgoing bit stream. Error Detection in this video, we are going to see about error detection. Error means a condition when output information is not same as input information. Four types of redundancy checks are used in data communication. Vertical redundancy check that is VRC. Longitudinal redundancy check that is LRC. Cyclic redundancy check that is CRC checksum. Vertical redundancy check that is VRC. The most common and least expensive mechanism for error detection. In this technique, a redundant bit called a parity bit is appended to every data unit. There are two types of parity bits used. Even parity, odd parity. Even parity. Even parity means the number of ones in the given word including the parity bit should be even, that is 2, 4, 6 and so on. Odd parity. Odd parity means the number of ones in the given word including the parity bit should be odd, that is 1, 3, 5 and so on. Use of parity bit 
the parity bit can be set to 0 and 1 depending on the type of the parity required. For even parity, this bit is set to 1 or 0 such that the number of 1 bits in the entire word is even. For odd parity, this bit is set to 1 or 0 such that the number of 1 bits in the entire word is odd. Append a single bit at the end of data block such that the number of 1s is even. VRC is also known as parity check. Longitudinal redundancy check that is LRC. In longitudinal redundancy check, a block of bits is divided into row and redundant row of bits is added to a whole block. Organize data into a table and create a parity for each column. Then, attach 8 parity to the original data and send them to the receiver. At the receiving end, the receiver checks LRC using same method. Some of the bits do not follow the even parity rule and the whole block is discarded. Cyclic redundancy check that is CRC. Cyclic redundancy check CRC is the most powerful method for error detection. A sequence of redundant bits called the CRC or the CRC reminder is appended to the end of a data unit. There are three basic steps used. A string of n zeros is appended to the data unit. The number n is one less than the number of bits in the predetermined divisor which is n plus 1 bits. The newly elongated data unit is divided by a divisor using a process called a binary division. The reminder resulting from this division is the CRC. The CRC of n bits is derived in step 2 replaces the appended zeros at the end of the data unit. At its destination, the incoming data unit is divided by the same divisor. If there is no reminder, the data unit is accepted is rejected. Error Correction In this video, we are going to see about error correction. Error correction is handled by two ways. Single bit error correction burst error correction single bit error correction let us take an ascii character of 7 bits the situations occur may be no error error in first bit error in second bit and so on up to error in seventh bit redundancy bit at first glance, we would need 3 redundant bits to perform correction of 7-bit ASCII characters because 3 bits can show 8 different states. However, errors can affect the redundant bits too. Number of redundant bits R should be chosen in such a way that all single bit errors and these are M plus R plus 1 ones can be corrected. Since R bits can have 2 power R different states, a sufficient condition is 2 power R is greater than or equal to M plus R plus 1. For example, for ASCII code M is equal to 7, the smallest value of R is 4. 16 is equal to 24 is greater than or equal to 7 plus 4 plus 1 which is equal to 12. Hamming code Place the redundant bits that is R bits in different positions. Each R bit is a parity bit or VRC bit for a subset of the entire data. 
Receiver checks the parity bit again and can identify the bit in error, if any. Placement of the R bits for ASCII characters R bits are placed in positions which are power of 2. Check bit R1 covers all odd numbered bits, for example, 1, 3, 5 and so on. Check bit R2 covers bits 2, 3, 6, 7, 10, 11. Check bit R4 covers bits 4, 5, 6, 7. Check bit R8 covers bits 8, 9, 10, 11, etc. Calculating the values of the R bits on the sender side. In the first step, we place each bit of the original character in its appropriate position in the 11 units. In the subsequent step, we calculate the even parities for the various bit combinations. The parity value for each combination is the value of the corresponding R bit. For example, the value of R1 is calculated to provide even parity for a combination of bits 3, 5, 7, 9 and 11. The value of R2 is calculated to provide even parity with bits 3, 6, 7, 10 and 11. The value of R4 is calculated to provide even parity with bits 4, 5, 6 and 7. The value of R8 is calculated to provide even parity with bits 8, 9, 10 and 11. Window-based flow control in this video, we are going to see about window-based flow control. Window-based flow control mechanisms limit the maximum amount of data that a sender can send at a given point of time, thereby preventing memory buffer overflows at the receiver. In a typical window-based flow control implementation, the data source maintains a transmission window. The size of this transmission window is kept equal to or lesser than the maximum available buffer space at the receiver. At any point of time, the source can only send as many packets to the receiver as the size of the transmission window. Thereafter, the sender of the data awaits the acknowledgement message from the receiver for each of these transmitted packets. With each acknowledgement received, the sender is allowed to transmit one more packet of data to the receiver. This protocol ensures that the maximum number of packets that the receiver has to buffer will never be greater than the transmission window size of the sender. Packets 1 to 4, which are towards the left of the transmission window, are those that have been acknowledged by the receiver. In other words, these are packets that have been successfully received or processed at the receiver. Thus, packets to the right of the transmission window are kept buffered at the sender. If the receiver is short of buffer space, it can withhold the transmission of acknowledgement, thus checking the flow of packets from the sender. Consider what would happen if an acknowledgement is received for packet 5 in the transmission window. 
In this case, packet 5 will move out of transmission window towards its left since the receiver has already acknowledged it. Also, since the sender can now send one more packet to the receiver, packet 9 will enter the transmission window. This operation can be seen as the transmission window sliding to the right by one packet. The simplest form of the window-based flow control mechanism is called the stop and wait scheme. In the scheme, the source waits for an acknowledgement from the receiver after the transmission of each packet. The acknowledgement from the receiver acts as a permission for sending the next packet. This scheme has the obvious disadvantage that successive packets can be sent only after a delay of one round trip propagation time, thereby reducing the data rates considerably. The stop and wait scheme can be improved by making only minor modifications. Instead of allowing just one packet, the source is allowed to send multiple packets wherein the number of packets that the sender can send without receiving an acknowledgement is referred to as the window size. The window size is kept static for the entire duration of the transmission, just like in the stop and wait scheme. Logical Link Control In this video, we are going to see about Logical Link Control. We said that Data Link Control handles framing, flow control and error control. In IEEE Project 802, flow control, error control and part of the framing duties are collected into one sublayer called the logical link control. Framing is handled in both the LLC sublayer and the MAC sublayer. The LLC provides one single data link control protocol for all IEEE LANs. In this way, the LLC is different from the Media Access Control sublayer, which provides different protocols for different LANs. A single LLC protocol can provide interconnectivity between different LANs because it makes the MAC sublayer transparent. One single LLC protocol serving several MAC protocols. Framing LLC defines a protocol data unit that is PDU that is somewhat similar to that of HDLC. The header contains a control field like the one in HDLC. This field is used for flow and error control. The two other header fields define the upper layer protocol at the source and destination that uses LLC. These fields are called the destination service access point that is DSAP and the source service access point that is SSAP. The other fields defined in a typical data link control protocol such as HDLC are moved to the MAC sublayer. In other words, a frame defined in HDLC is divided into a PDU at the LLC sublayer and a frame at the MAC sublayer. HDLC that is high level data link control. In this video we are going to see about HDLC that is high level data link control.
HDLC is the most important data link control protocol. Also, it is the basis for many other important data link control protocols, which uses the same or similar formats and the same mechanisms as employed in HDLC. It supports full duplex transparent mode operation and is now extensively used in both multipoint and computer networks. To satisfy a variety of applications, HDLC defines three types of stations. They are primary station, secondary station, combined station. The stations can be configured in different network configurations such as point to point with single primary and secondary multi point with single primary and multiple secondaries point to point with two primaries and two secondaries transfer modes of HDLC HDLC has three data transfer modes normal response mode that is NRM asynchronous response mode that is ARM asynchronous balanced mode that is ABM frame types in HDLC both data and control messages are carried in a standard format frame three classes of frame are used in HDLC unnumbered frames that is U frames information frames that is I frames supervisory frames that is S frames frame format HDLC uses synchronous transmission all transmissions are in the forms of frames The flag address and control bits before the information or data fields are known as a header. The FCS and flag fields following the data fields are referred as a trailer. Flag fields It has a unique pattern at both the ends of the frame structure. It identifies the start of the frame and end of the frame. The length of flag field is 8 bits. Address fields Address field states the destination address. The address field is usually 8 bits long but can be extended. Control fields Control fields contain frame numbers. Also, it controls the acknowledgement of frames. Control field is 8 or 16 bits in length. Data fields Data field contains the user data received from the network layer. It can be of variable length but in integral number of octets. FCS that is frame check sequence FCS is an error detecting code calculated from the remaining bits of the frame. FCS can be 16 bits or 32 bits long. HDLC operation The operation of HDLC involves three phases that is initialization, data transfer, disconnect. Initialization Initialization may be requested by either side so that frames may be exchanged in an orderly fashion. During this phase, the options that are to be used are agreed upon. Data transfer After initialization has been requested and accepted, then a logical connection is established. Two sites exchange user data and the control information to exercise flow and error control. 
disconnect hdlc module can initiate a disconnect either on its own initiative or at the request of its higher layer user hdlc issues a disconnect by sending a disconnect frame point to point protocol that is ppp in this video we are going to see about point to point protocol that is ppp ppp is the most commonly used protocol for point to point transfer of data the services provided by ppp are formatting of frames to transfer negotiation between devices to establish link encapsulation of data in data link frame authentication of devices point to point protocol can operate between point to point transmission link in full duplex mode Also point to point protocol can be used as a data link control to connect two routers frame format point to point protocol frame format is similar to hdlc flag field the flag field identifies the boundaries of point to point protocol frame that is each frame begins and ends with flag field this flag field is 1 byte in length address field address field indicates the address of destination address field is 1 byte that is 8 bits when the address field contains all ones that is 1111 this indicates that all stations are to accept the frames that is broadcast. Point to point protocol normally runs in connectionless mode, therefore, control field is set to 11000000. Protocol field Protocol field defines the information of data field. The protocol field is 1 or 2 bytes long. Data field The data field contains the actual data to transmit. The length of this field is variable. Frame check sequence that is FCS the frame check sequence field is 24 byte long and contains CRC code. It checks length of all fields in frame. Transition states The transition state is used to indicate the phases through which point-to-point -point protocol connection passes. The point-to-point -point protocol connection passes through five important states. Idle state, link establishing state, authenticate state, exchange of data state, terminate link state. Idle state. In the idle state, the link is not in use. The carrier is not activated in this state. Link establishing state. When carrier is detected, one of the endpoints starts the transmission, then connection enters into the link establishing state. Under this state, there is negotiation between the devices. On successful negotiation, the connection enters into authenticate state, otherwise it enters into idle state. Authenticate state. The authenticate state is mutually decided by the stations. The stations send several authentication packets. On successful authentication, the connection enters into exchange of data state, otherwise to the terminate link state. 
exchange of data state. This state is also referred as networking state. In this state, exchange of data started. The connection is terminated only after the any of the end points wants to terminate. Terminate link state. After data exchange is over, several packets are exchanged between end points for closing the link. PPP stack. In this video, we are going to see about PPP stack. PPP stack PPP uses a stack of other protocols for establishing link and to authentications. Two major protocols are used in PPP stack. These protocols are Link control protocol that is LCP Network control protocol that is NCP During connection, a PPP packet carry any of these protocols in its data field. Link control protocol that is LCP. The LCP performs the function of establishing, maintaining, configuring and termination of links. LCP also involves in negotiating mechanism between stations. The PPP carries LCP packet in either establishing or terminating state, that is, when user data is not carried. The frame format of LCP packet and how it is encapsulated in PPP frame. Code field Code field is one byte in length. The code field defines the type of LCP packet. ID. ID field is 1 byte in length L. D field is used to match the request packet with its reply packet. The request endpoint inserts a value in this field which is copied in corresponding field in reply packet. Length. The length field is 2 bytes. It defines the entire length of LCP packet. Information This is a variable length field. Any additional information needed by LCP packet is stored in this field. LCP packet types the LCP packets can be categorized according to their function. Network Control Protocol that is NCP The PPP uses Network Control Protocol that is NCP when it enters in exchange of data state. NCP is a set of protocols which allows encapsulation of data from network layer into PPP frame. PPP extends the negotiation not only in data link layer but in network layer also. The set of packets that establish and terminate a network layer connection for IP packets is called Inter-Network Protocol Control Protocol that is IPCP. X.25 CCITT standard for packet data transmission. In this video we are going to see about X.25 CCITT standard for packet data transmission. X.25 is an ITUT standard protocol suite for packet switched wide area network that is WAN communication. 
X.25 was originally defined by the International Telegraph and Telephone Consultative Committee, that is CCITT, now ITUT, in a series of drafts and finalized in a publication known as the Orange Book in 1976. X.25 is a standard suite of protocols used for packet switching across computer networks. The X.25 protocols works at the physical, data link and network layers that is layers 1 to 3 of the OSI model. Each X.25 packet contains up to 128 bytes of data. The X.25 network handles packet assembly at the source device, delivery, and then disassembly at the destination. X.25 packet delivery technology includes not only switching and network layer routing, but also error checking and retransmission logic should deliver the failures occur. X.25 supports multiple simultaneous conversations by multiplexing packets and using virtual communication channels. Based upon existing analog copper lines that experience a high number of errors, an X.25 WAN consists of packet switching exchange nodes, that is PSE nodes, as the networking hardware and leased lines, plain old telephone service connections or ISDN connections as physical links. Provides a way to send packets across a packet-switched public data network. The redundant error checking is done at each node. X.25 was originally designed more than 25 years ago to carry voice over analog telephone lines, that is, dial up networks. Typical applications of X.25 today include automatic teller machine networks and credit card verification networks. X.25 also supports a variety of mainframe terminal or server applications. Architecture The X.25 specification defines only the interface between a subscriber that is DTE and an X.25 network that is DCE. X.75, a very similar protocol to X.25, defines the interface between two X.25 networks to allow connections to traverse two or more networks. X.25 originally defined three basic protocol levels or architectural layers. The layer numbers were dropped to avoid confusion with the OSI model layers. Physical layer This layer specifies the physical, electrical, functional and procedural characteristics to control the physical link between a DTE and a DCE. Common implementations use X.21, EIA232, EIA449 or other serial protocols. Data Link Layer The Data Link Layer consists of the link access procedure for data interchange on the link between a DTE and a DCE. In its implementation, the link accessed procedure is a data link protocol that manages a communication session and controls a packet framing. Packet Layer This layer defines a packet layer protocol for exchanging control and user data packets to form a packet switching network based on virtual calls according to the packet layer. 
X.25 provides a set of user facilities defined and described in ITUT recommendation X.2. The X.2 user facilities fall into five categories. Essential facilities, additional facilities, conditional facilities, mandatory facilities, optional facilities. Medium Access Control In this video, we are going to see about Medium Access Control. All LANs and MANs consist of collections of devices that must share the network's transmission capacity. Some means of controlling access to the transmission medium is needed to provide an orderly and efficient use of that capacity. This is the function of a medium access control that is MAC protocol. The relationship between LLC and the MAC protocol can be seen by considering the transmission formats involved. User data are passed down to the LLC layer which prepares a link level frame known as an LLC protocol data unit that is PDU. This PDU is then passed down to the MAC layer where it is enclosed in a MAC frame. The exact format of the MAC frame differs somewhat for the various MAC protocols in use. MAC control this field contains any protocol control information needed for the functioning of the MAC protocol. For example, a priority level could be indicated here. Destination MAC address The destination physical attachment point on the LAN for this frame. Source MAC address the source physical attachment point in the land for this frame. LLC PDU The LLC data from the next higher layer. This includes the user data plus the source and destination service access points that is SAPs which indicate the user of LLC. CRC The cyclic redundancy check field, also known as the frame check sequence, that is FCS field. This is an error detecting code such as is used in other data link control protocols. The CRC is calculated based on the bits in the entire frame. The sender calculates the CRC and adds it to the frame. The receiver performs the same calculation on the incoming frame and compares that calculation to the CRC field in that incoming frame. If the two values don't match, then one or more bits have been accidentally altered in transit. In most data link control protocols, the data link protocol entity is responsible not only for detecting errors using the CRC, but for recovering from those errors by retransmitting the damaged frames. In the LAN protocol architecture, these two functions are split between the MAC and LLC layers. The MAC layer is responsible for detecting errors and discarding any frames that contain errors. The LLC layer optionally keeps track of which frames have been successfully received and retransmits unsuccessful frames. Random Access In this video, we are going to see about Random Access. Random access 
In the 1970s, Norman Abramson and his colleagues at the University of Hawaii devised a new and elegant method to solve the channel allocation problem. Their work has been extended by many researchers since then, Abramson, 1985. Although Abramson's work called the Aloha system used ground-based radio broadcasting, the basic idea is applicable to any system in which uncoordinated users are competing for the use of a single shared channel. There are two versions of Aloha. Pure, slotted. Pure Aloha. The basic idea of an Aloha system is simple, lets the users to transmit whenever they have data to be sent. There will be collisions of course and the colliding frames will be damaged. However, due to the feedback property of broadcasting, a sender can always find out whether its frame was destroyed by listening to the channel the same way other users do. With a LAN, the feedback is immediate. With a satellite, there is a delay of 270 milliseconds before the sender knows if the transmission was successful. If listening while transmitting is not possible for some reasons, acknowledgements are needed. If the frame was destroyed, the sender just waits a random amount of time and sends it again. The waiting time must be random or the same frames will collide over and over in lockstep. Systems in which multiple users share a common channel in a way that can lead to conflicts are widely known as contention systems. We have made the frames all the same length because the throughput of Aloha systems is maximized by having a uniform frame size rather than by allowing variable length frames. Whenever two frames try to occupy the channel at the same time, there will be a collision and both will be garbled. The checksum cannot and should not distinguish between a total loss and a near miss. Let the frame time denote the amount of time needed to transmit the standard fixed length frame that is the frame length divided by the bit rate. At this point we assume that the infinite population of users generates new frames according to a Poisson distribution with mean n frames per frame time. If n is greater than 1, the user community is generating frames at a higher rate than the channel can handle and nearly every frame will suffer a collision. For reasonable throughput, we would expect 0 less than n less than 1. In addition to the new frames, the stations also generate retransmissions of frames that previously suffered collisions. Let us further assume that the probability of k transmission attempts per frame time, old and new combined is also poison with mean g per frame time. Clearly, g is greater than or equal to n. At low load, that is n is equal to 0, there will be few collisions, hence few retransmissions. So, g is less than n. At high load, there will be many collisions, so g is greater than n. Under all loads, the throughput s is just the offered load, g times the probability, P0 of a transmission succeeding that is S is equal to GP0 where P0 is the probability that a frame does not suffer a collision. 
Under what conditions will the shaded frame arrive undamaged? Let T be the time required to send a frame. If any other user has generated a frame between time T0 and T0 plus TR, the end of that frame will collide with the beginning of the shaded one. In fact, the shaded frame's rate was already sealed even before the first bit was sent. But since in pure Aloha, a station does not listen to the channel before transmitting, it has no way of knowing that another frame was already underway. Similarly, any other frame started between T0 plus T and T0 plus 2T will bump into the end of the shaded frame. The probability that K frames are generated during a given frame time is given by the Poisson distribution. Equation PR of K is equal to G power K into E power minus G by K factorial. So the probability of zero frames is just E power minus G. The probability of no other traffic being initiated during the entire vulnerable period is thus given by P0 is equal to E power minus 2G using S is equal to G P0. We get S is equal to G E power minus 2G. The relation between the offered traffic and the throughput. Slotted Aloha In 1972, Roberts published a method for doubling the capacity of an Aloha system, Robert 1972. His proposal was to divide time into discrete intervals, each interval corresponding to one frame. This approach requires the users to agree on slot boundaries. One way to achieve synchronization would be to have one special station emit a pip at the start of each interval like a clock. In Robert's method, which has come to be known as slotted aloha, in contrast to Abramson's pure aloha, a computer is not permitted to send whenever a carriage return is typed. Instead, it is required to wait for the beginning of the next slot. Thus, the continuous pure aloha is turned into a discrete one. Since the vulnerable period is now halved, the probability of no other traffic during the same slot as our test frame is E power minus G. Equation S is equal to G into E power minus G. Slotted Aloha peaks at G is equal to 1 with a throughput of S is equal to 1 by E or about 0 0.368 twice that of pure Aloha. PK is equal to E power minus G into 1 minus E power minus G into K minus 1. The expected number of transmissions E per carriage return typed is then E is equal to Summation k is equal to 1 to infinity k into pk is equal to summation k is equal to 1 to infinity k into e power minus g into 1 minus e power minus g into k minus 1 is equal to e power g. As a result of the exponential dependence of e upon g, small increase in the channel load can drastically reduce its performance. CSMA, that is Carrier Sense Multiple Access Protocols. In this video, we are going to see about CSMA, that is Carrier Sense Multiple Access Protocols. CSMA with slotted aloha, the best channel utilization that can be achieved is 1 by E. This is hardly surprising since with stations transmitting at will Without paying attention to what the other stations are doing, there are bound to be many collisions. In local area networks, 
However, it is possible for stations to detect what other stations are doing and adapt their behavior accordingly. Protocols in which stations listen for a carrier that is a transmission and act accordingly are called carrier sense protocols. A number of them have been proposed. Klein, Rock and Tobagi in 1975 have analyzed several such protocols in detail. Below we will mention several versions of the carrier sense protocols. Persistent CSMA, Non-Persistent CSMA, P-Persistent CSMA, CSMA with collision detection, Persistent and non-persistent CSMA protocols are clearly an improvement over ALOHA because they ensure that no station begins to transmit when it senses the channel busy. Another improvement is for stations to abort their transmissions as soon as they detect a collision. In other words, if two stations sense the channel to be idle and begin transmitting simultaneously, they will both detect the collision almost immediately. Rather than finish transmitting their frames, which are irretrievably garbled in any way, they should abruptly stop transmitting as soon as the collision is detected. Quickly terminating damaged frames saves time and bandwidth. This protocol known as CSMA CD that is CSMA with collision detection is widely used on lands in the MAC sub layer. CSMA CD as well as many other land protocols uses the conceptual model. At the point marked T0, a station has finished transmitting its frame. Any other station having a frame to send may now attempt to do so. If two or more stations decide to transmit simultaneously, there will be a collision. Collisions can be detected by looking at the PAR or pulse width of the received signal and comparing it to the transmitted signal. After a station detects a collision, it aborts its transmission, waits a random period of time and then tries again assuming that no other station has started transmitting in the meantime. Therefore, our model for CSMA CD will consist of alternating contention and transmission periods with idle periods occurring when all stations are quiet for example, for lack of work. Now let us look closely at the details of the contention algorithm. Suppose that two stations both begin transmitting at exactly time t0. How long will it take them to realize that there has been a collision? The answer to this question is vital to determining the length of the contention period and hence what the delay and throughput will be. The minimum time to detect the collision is then just the time it takes a signal to propagate from one station to the other. Based on this reasoning, you might think that a station not hearing a collision for a time equal to the full cable propagation time after starting its transmission could be sure it had seized the cable. By seized, we mean that all other stations knew it was transmitting and would not interfere. This conclusion is wrong considering the following worst case scenario. 
Let the time for the signal to propagate between the two farthest station be at T0, one station begins transmitting. At an instant before the signal arrives at the most distant station, that station also begins transmitting. Of course, it detects the collision almost instantly and stops, but the little noise burst caused by the collision does not get back to the original station until time. Scheduling Mechanisms In this video, we are going to see about scheduling mechanisms. Packets from different networks are to be multiplexed and queued in buffer for transmission on a link. The methods of selecting queued packets for transmission are called as link scheduling discipline. It plays an important role in providing better QoS. Different queuing methods are first in first out that is FIFO priority queuing, round-robin queuing, weighted fair queuing that is WFQ, first in first out that is FIFO. In FIFO link scheduling mechanism, packets arriving are queued for transmission on link on first come first served basis. The packets arriving are stored in buffer as they arrive. When the buffer is full, the packets are discarded. Arriving packets are shown in numbers on time axis. The packets are then processed by servers. Definite time is required to service a packet. Then the packets are sent for departure on link. Priority queuing In priority queuing, the packets arriving are classified into two or more priority classes. Each priority class has a separate queue. The packet from the highest priority queue is selected for transmission. Among same priority class, the packet is selected on FIFO manner. The operation of priority queuing model. 1, 3, 4 are from high priority class and packets 2, 5 are from low priority class. High priority class packets are transmitted first than the low priority class packets. Round Robin Queuing In Round Robin Queuing, packets are again sorted into classes that is, Round Robin Scheduler alternately switches transmitting link among the classes. Packets 1, 2, 4 are from class 1 and packets 3, 5 are from class 2 on transmission of packet 1. The link scheduler looks for class 2 packets that is packet 3 then for class 1 that is packet 3 and so on. Weighted fair queuing that is WFQ. In WFQ, the arriving packets are classified and queued in several classes. Scheduler serves all classes of queues in circular manner. First, class 1 is served, then class 2 is served, then class 3 is served and the service pattern moves on to the next class. And thus the service pattern is repeated. Each class is assigned a weight and as per this weight, the service time of that class is varying.